In high school, we played a game. Many years later, we got back together to play one more. Little did we know, this time, the game was real. Join me, Aram Vartian, on Start Playing Games for a brand new type of fantasy role-playing. In Die RPG, you play a group of real-world, deeply flawed adults who are transported into a fantasy realm via a predatory, sinister role-playing game. The game transforms your characters into paragons and rewards them with strange and frightening powers. In Die RPG, you are confronted with your truest desires and deepest fears. And only you can decide when the game is over. Check out all of my available Start Playing Games campaigns at aram.gay. My name is Aram, and my pronouns are he, him. I'm the producer of the Dungeon and Dragons podcast, God's Fall. My name's Dylan. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm a physicist from Canada. Welcome to Kill, Kill Every, Every Monster. Monster. Aram, we talk about the sort of power level of monsters a little bit. We talk about how strong they are, how big a fight they are. I want to talk about lethality. I'm going to qualify this. We have talked about how easy it is for a monster to take a party from full health to zero hit points. I want to talk about zero hit points. When does a monster do a murder? How much will a monster just go for the kill? How much will these individual creatures always go for the kill as, a, as opposed to which ones might spare a player? Yeah. And I, I don't think this is necessarily tied to monsterdom either, because I think this is something that's tied to strategy, the way they act a little bit. A mind player is no less monstrous because they spared a PC for now. Yeah. One of the sort of case studies of this is if you're fighting a pack of wolves and they're actually just wolves and they drop a party member, they're probably not going to outright kill that person on the spot, but they will immediately abandon the fight and try to drag that body out into the woods. I think that bit of behavior is an interesting thing to talk about, so that's why I pitched this episode. And this is something that I want to pull up front. This is a hypothetical discussion. Unless you have talked through with your players some degree of like, hey, this fight could be really lethal, PC death is always a big deal for the party. So taking a nothing fight and just killing them because it's what the monster would do is as shitty as the players acting like dickheads and then going, but it's what my character would do. It's all fiction. Bullshitted in the moment to do what is fun for the table. If your players come across a grizzly bear in the forest, they would expect to be attacked. However, maybe the grizzly bear had just fed. Yeah. Maybe the grizzly bear was distracted. Maybe their cubs are further north and they just want to get away. How many times do you watch a video in Cinema Sins is like, why wouldn't the villain just murder the hero here? Because there's an hour and a half left in the movie. Shut up. How many tables have you been at where if you told the players, like, the villain wiped the party and then just smugly, like, gave a pithy line to the paladin and kicked him in the face and then left? And if you told the party afterwards, like, yeah, reasonably, the, the villain would have murdered you, but then the campaign would be over, your entire table will go, yeah, that's fair. I appreciate that you didn't just murder me. If you want to make a real villain, a real villain takes risks in order for flamboyance to happen. Yes. Any good villain <laughs> is a flamboyant mess. You will always trade flamboyance for practicality. That is a good villain. And if you just wiped six people and there's one person left, if you kill that person, no one knows you just wiped six people. The story is more important than the practicality. Absolutely. I think go through this sort of monster by monster for the season. Off the top, Aram, Banshees, does it murder? Okay, here's my first question. Yes. Does it murder in the book? I guess we're just going straight by the book. From what the book says, does it murder? 
if you were running a banshee and you weren't concerned about your player, if you weren't being a good DM, right? If you're just running a banshee, does it murder? For me personally, especially after talking to Orla, 100% a banshee is a spiteful, mean, angry lady. And if you did the bad, it's here to punish you so the bad doesn't happen again. It's a mean, spiteful creature that kind of wants to get away and be on its own. So if you've come to it, you've invited a fight and it is very willing to give it to you. And its abilities back up that fight. Oh, yeah. Whale is incredibly devastating. Uh, The whale has no effect on constructs or undead, but all other creatures within 30 feet of it that can hear her must make a DC 13 constitution saving throw on a failure. They are dropped to zero hit points. They just dropped to zero. So they, they might just die on their own. And this is one of the situations where like, if you survive a fight with a Banshee, it's because the Banshee whales, everybody falls. And then it's like, this is too close to my territory. So I had to let them know and I'll leave now. But if you wandered into the Banshee's lair, the place where it makes its home, and it drops you, I have no doubt that it's wandering along and just like, oh, you've started making saves, and now the Banshee chokes you to death while you're on the floor. While the others are watching and struggling to survive, she would just glide from one to the next. One to the next. But a Banshee would leave one alive to tell the tale. Uh, I think that's fair. I think this is especially when you remember that story about the like the football team that got cursed and hasn't won. Yeah, I see that as feasible. I, I think that's a fair way to run that. I also think that Banshees, while they could be very lethal, would be very inclined to frighten or spook, maybe not even fully reveal themselves. I really think it's a function of distance. Like if you imagine sort of the epicenter as being the the Banshee lair, there is a probability function of like, if you're at the edge of the territory. Yeah. Might drop you in. If a wolf eats your face while you're unconscious, that's not my fucking problem. Out to you are in my home, you will die. I will leave your corpse to rot in the corner. Yeah. Should you even touch the front door? Yeah. The pain will be excruciating. Absolutely. Because they are bitter creatures. Resentful creatures. Resentful. And resentful, bitter creatures would be really resentful if you fuck with their shit. Exactly. Number two. Goblin. I'm saying no. I'm saying no, yes. Individually, no. Even as a group. Part of the reason we ran that goblin encounter the way we did right. is because most of the time when you fight a goblin, again, assuming you're not going into its home, I think once you turn this into a full-blown personal defense issue, new cards are in play. Okay. But nine times out of ten, a goblin has a goal it's trying to accomplish and has gotten into a fight with the PCs entirely like perpendicular to its goals it doesn't care if you live or die it's going to knock you out then pick up the barrel it was stealing and continue running if you get involved with ants the ants are going to react but they don't care they just want to go back to being ants yeah you are a perturbation in the goblin's day and it does not care enough to murder you yeah but maybe okay okay but again that's one aspect of goblins as we discussed in the episode, incredibly lethal. If there is a strike team of goblins that just hit and hide and hit and just keep using guerrilla tactics against you, they could wear you down quite They could take down any party. Yeah, they could drop the party, but we're also talking like you've run the fight too strong. The goblins have dropped the party to zero. To me, one, if you're mid-fight and someone drops to zero, the goblins are going to move on from that person. To if the fight ends, the fight ends, everyone's on the ground. They might have an inclination to hostages, but like they're not going to just go around and slit throats on the floor. I would agree. That's not a very goblin way. No. Whenever I think of goblins taking hostages, I think it, I just think of the scene of the Ewoks where they're all on poles and there's a big, huge party and they think one of them like might be a good guy. Yeah. I I can absolutely, especially early on in the game, because this is a great way to stage the prison break, is to have five feet away from the cage, two goblins arguing about like, yeah, we have hostages. Okay, we have not actually managed to do this before. What what do we do with them? What do we do with them? 
They're the dogs that caught the car. Yeah. They have no we idea. We have hostages now. Right. This is a good who, who thing. Who are they? Who do we contact? What do we want? We can ransom them. What, who, who's going to pay the ransom? Somebody. Well, we don't know who they are. Yeah. Who are you? The idea of goblins accidentally posting their own, like, bounty. A party wandering through town and it's a sign of, we are goblins, we have kidnapped adventurers, please come pay the ransom for the adventurers. And the parties just think that's like, okay, I guess we're going to go free some adventurers from some goblins. Maybe it's four really shitty people and the goblins actually did everyone a favor. The idea of one goblin who has managed to get into charge and has a while just like thinks this is a pyramid scheme. Right. Like, no, the notice will lure in adventurers and then we'll take them hostage too and we'll hold more adventurers for ransom. The more adventurers we have to ransom, the more it will pay off when we finally let the adventurers have the hostages. They never got anyone. The sign is the first play to capture the, <laughs> the, the party's just the first people who showed up and then everything goes very poorly for them. Barring, like, obviously there are circumstances where you could motivate it, but I don't think a goblin does a murder. A goblin does a capture and a scheme. Yeah, goblins have other shit going on. They don't care if you live or die. Totally agreed on the goblin. You want to take this one? Werewolves. Werewolves are the one where I think this gets interesting because it's a big if. It's dependent on how you run your werewolves, what state the werewolf is in. Because if you're running the werewolf as more of a disease and a lack of control thing and you're at full moon, then this isn't even a wolf. This is a weird combination of anger and hate and humanity and animal. And I think a full-blown full moon werewolf will not just drop a party member, but the moment they hit zero, ignore the rest of the party and tear them apart. Right. I will keep tearing apart the flesh in front of me until something sufficiently distracts me. This is where I keep putting in these caveats of unless that is very specifically the game that I am running, I would never actually do that. I'll let them distract them and he'll like, you know, jump to another target. I won't punish the players, but if we're talking about them just as creatures, more than likely, yes, they would just fury kill until something was dead. If they're not moon crazy. Yeah, if you're not dealing with the full-blown lunar feral werewolf. Then I would say that it's a different set of factors, because if there's a fight and they've wounded you, there's a very good chance you'll now be a werewolf. So they have to decide, do they leave you alive and are they responsible for another creature? Oh, that's really interesting. Or do they take your throat and cut out the cycle there? When I've dropped one of the party, do I point, just rip out their throat, hold it up to the party and go like, are we done now? Or do I have to do it again? Which would imply, again, that they can be lethal, but can choose there is a hesitation to. to, right, that there be a desire to not just murder everyone in general, like most people are. Yeah. We're inclined to not murder everyone. End of the day, the werewolf is a person. And it's just a question of like, how to phrase this, that combination of person and animal can bring out the worst in both of them. Yeah. So you can absolutely wind up in that scenario where you're like, oh, no, no, this werewolf is just a dude. But then once you've incorporated that wolf, like, like I said, a wolf might either be scared and just like be fighting for the opportunity to get out or it might be hungry and it's just fighting until it has meat and then it leaves with the meat. But a werewolf might kill a person for the sake of doing it or for the sake of an intimidation move, just pure power, like, this is how I'm finishing the fight. But a werewolf would probably negotiate. Yeah. In general, or at least disengage. A, a werewolf that has enough people brain going on yeah. is going to try to find a way out. A werewolf is one of the creatures that can be sufficiently feral to just do an outright murder mid-combat. Not even after the TPK, just I'm not going to stop until this thing stops breathing. Green Hag. <laughs> Green Hag, I think, for the most part, wants to toy with you, wants to play with you. Doesn't feel the need to. Honestly, I think it's exactly what we had with Sally. 
if they get you down to near dead, that's good enough because hopefully you've learned. Right. Like they'll do the appraisal. Is this like, is this a paladin so upright that if I send him on his way, he'll just come back once he's healed? Well, then that's inconvenient. Clip that one here. Is this a random adventurer who wandered into a place where they haven't been and now you've learned your lesson? I will drag you out of the swamp, put you up on a rock, and leave a little note on your chest that just says, do not come back. Or I'm just smarter than you, and I'm going to point you in a direction I need you, because I've got plans within plans, because I'm 10,000 years old, and you've suddenly become a pawn. Yeah. I think all of those options would come before just straight out murdering you. It's very interesting as a thing to think about, to me at least, as a person who doesn't generally think about philosophy, because I am soulless yeah basically to do the killing there has to be a certain level of interest in life think about it as like oh you're willing to kill you don't value life but there's also a threshold where you've valued it even less to where the murder just seems like why would i if i kill you i have to clean up the corpse that's so much work hags don't usually they're not going to act that much out of anger or rashness, they are long-lived, calculating creatures who probably have a lot more patience, I would imagine, than the average adventurer. They're willing to believe that, like, no, 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 I'll finish this, and then you just go home, for the love of God. Or maybe, again, a lot of them live out in the middle of the woods alone because they don't want to be, you know, hassled in general, but the occasional distraction, that's fun, they yeah. probably want to engage like, yeah. oh, you know, send me the occasional adventurer. They when yeah. they lose, they're desperate to bargain and they're very useful. I think that a hag of sufficient means and intelligence would understand the value of a little bit of chaos in a long term plan to test at the edges. The competent version of the goblin plan where it's like, no, an adventurer shows up. Well, this one isn't useful. I'll slap him around a little bit, send him back to town, and then he'll tell the other adventurers and eventually someone I can use will show up. If adventurers keep showing up and the hag murders them, well, maybe the king gets involved and then there's an army and that's a problem. A party of adventurers is at worst going to be an inconvenience. If I keep sending them back and then like the town goes off like, there's a hag living in our forest and we've sent our strongest adventurers in and they keep getting beaten. And Oh, so the hag is murdering? Well, no, no, no. She's, she's been rude to them. Rather rude. She's beaten them to a bloody pulp. And then, honestly, uh, one of them was dragged back in a stretcher by a very large spider deposited in the center of town and then just left. A hag has probably invested a lot of time in wherever they are and whatever they're doing. They don't want unnecessary attention and bodies bring eyes. Yeah. Hag, no murder unless it's absolutely gotta. No murder unless it's advantageous. Or unless they absolutely have to. <laughs> Same deal, Incubus. She got a sack dick. Absolutely no murder unless it's got her. Right, murder does nothing for them. It benefits them in no way. Murder is a failure. A complete fail state, because I feel like when you're dealing with that sort of cosmic element of like you are trying to do battles between heaven and hell and get souls, someone dies fighting a fiend. If that's a case, like they, they might get out of hell on that one. Plus, you don't get the soul. Like, someone else is going to check that soul. If you have to kill them, the soul goes to some other demon. They get they get the points, or they have to file them. Maybe it's just loose. That's how we get, like, the, the Lemur, or I think it's Lemur for devils, is just, yeah, they're going to go, they're just going to go to hell now. If you're particularly vengeful, you might go and, like, fuck with them yeah. later. But for the most part, you lost. You lost the game. I have invested too much time in you to kill you. And again, as far as patience, very patient A creatures. Millennia. If they die, they come back. They live eternally. Incredibly patient creatures. They may have plans that last from like the time you're eight years old to right before your deathbed. And that's when they got you. Especially the idea of a, an incubus getting into a fight only to die in that fight and just like half acid and then three weeks later come back out of the pit it's fine though i forgive you an incubus will absolutely die 
just to prove a point. They are that kind of queen. Especially if they don't, like, if they think you don't know yet, I will let you kill me, let you fester on the fact that you did a murder, and then wander into the room wearing the exact same face as before. Just walking into some fancy party in the burial suit, brushing off the dirt. My, that was a lovely ceremony. As you grab a goblet of wine. If an incubus was to kill one of their targets out of rage or frustration, or they just got pinned into a corner, it'd be a strike on their record. People would be like, oh, well. Not working with that. Can't trust that one. No, he's a, f- a fucking let down that creature. Then around the mortals a bit too long, inherited some of their impatience. Doppelgangers are people. That's my answer for that one. And in the world where doppelgangers would exist, they don't want trouble. They are not looking for trouble. It, maybe there's that one doppelganger serial killer. Sure. sure. Just like 100%. With people. Yeah. Would that person be fucking terrifying? Absolutely. Goddamn hundred fucking percent. But a doppelganger in general, like I said, it's it's a dude. It will murder as frequently as dudes do. But like in the middle of a fight, they are just trying to get to a different goal. They don't want to kill you. They want to live their life. Unless they're that one person that wants to kill and then that's their life. And I am really sorry for anyone who lives in that city. Because, boy, oh boy, Christ. good luck. That's fucked. Mom? But how did you, you know, stab? Like, it's like that throughout the whole city. It's like, it's that one final, like, moment of joy and then betrayal right as your eyes roll back. Just happening over and over. The anti-incubus. Horrifying. The Flump does not have the capacity to reduce a player character to zero hit points, let alone do a goddamn thing once they've hit that point. It doesn't have the ability, nor does it have the want to kill anything. If they accidentally squished a beetle, they'd be in mourning for like a week. God, I hate Flump so much. These are such a bullshit creature. They're the best creatures. And if you use them right in ecology as well. We're not going to do the fucking episode. The point is... No, in no way is the flump lethal. Absolutely never. Mimics are a fun one. I think mimics 100%. They're ambush predators. They want to kill you or use you to propagate themselves. Actually, in that second case, if we're going with sort of the the setup we talked about with Robert, then you're going to take coins out and leave, and you'll never find out that it was a mimic. If you know it's a mimic, that means that the mimic is trying to kill you. If a mimic has revealed itself, it's because it expects you to die. It's the whole thing of the lid slams shut and then your legs fall on the outside while it starts digesting your torso. (laughs) The mimic wants you dead. You are food. It is trying to eat. Even if it's giving you its babies, it still sees you as food. Yeah, you'll hold on to them until they start trying to eat you. And then the strong ones will survive. It is a lethal creature who wants to kill you. Hands down. Also with that whole idea of like tiny rust monsters that do like sort of a coin camouflage, a mimic rust monster sort of symbiosis would definitely exist. It'd be a whole wonderful dungeon ecosystem. A mimic rust monster is an unbelievably destructive creature. You would have a fantastic little ecosystem down in a dungeon with an ooze, a mimic, and rust monsters where they're just consuming things. All right, that's horrifying. What do we got next? Troll. I think the troll does a murder. I think the troll casually does a murder. Yeah. Because it's funny. It's the bug still squirming, squish it. It's that sweet spot just before the hag with indifference to life. A troll is amused by your death. A troll likes to hear your skull crunch beneath its heel. It's sort of the same thing we were talking about with the, uh, well, there's a couple of monsters that fall into this category where if the fight starts, the target shifts. A troll is not going to try to kill you from the outset. It's not sitting on the side of the road, seeing a person go by and going, you, today is your last day. Right. Now that the fight has started, 
we did the competition. I won the competition. That means I get to squish your head. That's the rules. And then I squish your head. Honestly, if a troll has multi-attack, then I think, like, if the PC gets dropped, then I might outright kill the PC and then use the second attack of the round to swing at somebody else. Again, not actually in a game, only under the specific conditions of, like, like very specifically, I went in with the players and was like, hey, we're doing a high lethality, like the monsters are out for blood type. Don't fucking do that. Assuming we got players buy-in, right? A troll would revel in viscera. Yeah. Would enjoy swinging around entrails and bathing in blood. It's a troll, of course. It would absolutely threaten. You leave or I will take him and I will beat you to death with his corpse. And I would kill that guy and then I would pick his body up and try to bludgeon another party member with it. Just have the paladin's head in your mouth. <laughs> Tell them to stop fighting. He says to stop fighting. A troll would pull that shit. And I think that's honestly one of the more interesting things to do with trolls is not to finish fights, but to just get to the point where you're just like, no, no, I don't care. I will kill you. <laughs> I don't think oozes are capable of murder because they are not intelligent. The entire thing with an ooze is that it's going to engulf you, and then if you go into death saves, you will die. And that's it. It's just a pitcher plant. It's just feeding. Yeah. A gelatinous cube, a gray ooze, an ochre jelly, a black pudding. They're all just things that are trying to eat. Now we get to the Jubilex. Well, Jubilex is a fucking, basically a god, is it not? At that point, it very, very much would revel in, like, I bet that it likes to put you inside you and feel you squirm as it dissolves you. I bet it gets off on that. Oozes in general don't care enough to kill you because they're completely neutral. They're not even animals. They're not feeding. They're just doing. You are a thing that fell into the acid pit, so now you're going to melt. Jubilex is explicitly evil and will try to kill you because it's a demon lord. It just does that. It'll love it. It'll have fun. And it would have fun, like, killing your whole family in front of you and then killing you when you're in your most vulnerable state. Like, it would just have joy from that. That being said, that is one of the reasons why I'm not a huge fan of using a gelatinous cube or an ooze in general in a game outside of, like, as an interference, like, a yeah. as something you have to overcome. Because the moment you enter into that fight, you aren't just at risk of dropping someone, you are at risk of accidentally killing someone in the party. Yep, in a very terrible way. If someone gets engulfed and they can't get out in time, you now have to be the one sitting there sort of on the back foot debating, like, do I just come out right and say it to my players? Like, hey, this ooze is going to just let you go now because if I don't, you're going to die. Or do I just kill this? Like, how do, you, how do I handle this? And you've got, like, Technical problems, too, now, because if yeah. a player did just get it completely dissolved by a gelatinous cube and their bones are now floating inside it, you got to get one of those bones to be able to cast a lower level mm -hmm. resurrection spell when you get home. So you can't just leave. You've now got to get one of those bones out. That fight has to end. And if we got to the point where one of the players is dead, this fight is apparently not one that they were ready for. It is a huge risk to put a gelatinous cube in a 10 foot wide hallway and tell your players to go. You gotta be fucking ready for that possibility. They gotta like find some way to get like a metal cord across the passageway. So as it goes through, it cuts through the middle and pulls a bone out. Like you gotta get you just got a metal out. net. It's just scooping. <laughs> just gonna sift your gelatinous cube. The idea of having that like somewhere in a dungeon and having like the, the dwarven delving team making that move of like oh no 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 we made enough on the last one we can we can afford a uh a raised dead we just need to get his bones out we have a system it's okay a careless prince we got to get him back it's been too long now so we need a bone you have to go in there and get that bone so we can resurrect this idiot mm -hmm. so his dad's happy yeah that's a fun adventure that's an interesting adventure incredibly lethal if the situation is right they don't care. They're not trying to kill you. Also, the idea of like, if you can keep the the thing stationary and then just trying to do a uh, 
animate dead from the outside of the ooze. Walk out. Wake up the skeleton. W- come here. Walk forward. Come here. It's not going to try to hold on to you anymore. You don't have meat. All right. Done. Not terribly lethal because it doesn't, it's not trying. I mean, incredibly lethal specifically because it's not trying. Just, right. just be careful, Christ. Yeah, just be careful and you're fine. It's like, you know, is acid lethal? Yes, if you fall in, it's very lethal. Will a fire murder a player? Yeah, if the player lays down in a fire, it'll die. Yeah, try not to get in the way of a fire. So, skeletons and zombies. No and yes, respectively. Agreed. Because the skeletons don't care. Skeletons are following orders. But the zombie very much does. If a skeleton is told, defend this place, and it knocks you unconscious, there's a very good chance that the skeleton's like, well, that's that done. And it just goes back to standing guard. Unless the skeleton's order is, kill those people. It may just continuously bring you food. Just may bring you a rotted apple over and over, right? But a zombie? Oh, no. A zombie is a meat machine that never sleeps, that never rests, and if it gets whiff of you, will hunt you until it consumes you. Until it becomes inconvenient to do so. Like, the moment it, like, tries to walk forward and it can't walk forward anymore, it may wander off in another direction. But if you drop, a zombie is that maximum tier of, like, it will drop you. And it will not stop. It will not finish the fight before it kills you. There is no reason for it to go anywhere else except for the delicious meat that it has finally got its teeth into. If this is on a scale of flump to something, it would be flump to zombie, I would feel. A zombie will always try and kill you. Absolutely. Unless, like, I would say the singular case where it wouldn't is under immediate command of a necromancer right if it was hijacked but you could say that for anything like if i cast hold monster right yeah it's suddenly i can beholder is less angry if you paralyze it any creature that's dominated can be used as a tool for a more evil thing sure actually even then having that as a way to show like a lower tier necromancer someone who's commanding an army of undead and it's like good drop them bring them to me and the zombie starts like tearing someone apart and they're trying to pull back hey 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 what did i say yeah you can absolutely play it for comedy or you could have something like you know the vizier who's trying to overthrow the kingdom good bring me the prince and then the zombie starts eating the prince and you realize like oh god i have done something terrible this is wildly out of my hands now Wait, so they ate him. So now you got to weaken at Bernie's him until like, so you have to raise him and like no, pass no, him off. This is okay. As the this prince. is okay. This is okay. I can make this work. Yeah. This is going to be fine. Oh, oh, God. Oh, oh, God. Oh, oh, we can fuck. fix it. We can fix it. He's still fresh. Okay. Um, shit. Someone find me a head. I need, ex- I need specifically a right ear and a foot. And a scarf, please. We're not fixing the throat. Just get me a yeah, scarf. A big, thick scarf. Thank God it's winter. <laughs> That's a fun campaign. First of all, bonus content, people. You are welcome. These are fun campaigns. These are great ideas. Use these at your table. All right. Who's next? Uh, The vampire. Yes, 100%. Absolutely. Wants to kill you. Wants to puppet you. Wants to, you know, dance you around. But below the zombie in that it will wipe the party. And then I, I think, honestly, same as like maybe the banshee or the hag where it might like leave someone to tell the tale but i could imagine like having the last person on the ground semi-conscious eyes open trying to make the last few death saves trying to get up and the vampire is just walking from person to person murder murder actually you're going to be useful bite toss murder i see them maybe feeding getting amped up on blood and leaving or perhaps enslaving all of them yeah like there's other options before it just murders the whole party so it could it is definitely capable of it but it'd probably rather make toys or slaves or just ignore people i got to the end of curses strahd once you're the first one it got to the end and i went all out i dropped the party cleric but we had a paladin who was comboing a sun sword and smites fun so they had me like on my back foot and the final decision was just, I always run Strahd the way I think everybody does. 
he's bored. He's doing this for his own amusement. He has no interest in dying. So he's just pick up the cleric. Like, this one isn't dead yet. Do you want to leave or am I finishing it? This can go either way. It's your call because I, you're doing quite well. Better than I expected you to. And this is rather unfortunate. And I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a little bit nervous. So the question is, do you want to see if maybe you can kill me and I can definitely kill him? Or do you want to go home? All right. Last one for season one. The Deva. Devas. Devas. Deva. Right? Or is it Deva? Still Deva. Devas. <laughs> season one, Devas, that I always say correctly. Yes. The first line of that episode is you asking how to say it, too. <laughs> it is. It really is. I think getting it wrong. Yep. So... Davis, no, of course not. They don't want to kill anything. They don't want to kill anything. Um, I, but this is the thing. But if they do, but if they're told to, then they are unstoppable machines. Where does the word smite come from? Agreed. So again, it is like, do they want to though? Do yes. they have any desire to? No. We've got the two cases of there's an angel in the room and you're like, I don't want that to be there anymore. And you decide you're going to fight it. It won't kill you. It'll slap the absolute shit out of you. And unless you are unequivocally evil, it'll just be like, have you learned the lesson? Right. Unless you need to be banished, you're going to live. And then there's the Sodom and Gomorrah option. Destroy this thing. Yeah. Remove it from my divine sight. Have it be as if it never was. Then yes, they're the Terminator. It's one of those situations where I almost wish the... The angels had more, like, aggressive spells. Laser eyes and shit, right? Not even necessarily that. Like, the idea of it wanders in and it does battle with the mace. And then it has the cleanup spell of good. Now that they're all done, fireball. We are cleaning the earth, leaving nothing but ash and salt. It should be able to basically, what's the one thing a cleric can do? Uh, it should be able to flame a strike down onto itself as the center target and just have holy flame spread out from that as a cleansing move. And then that would like recall them, right? Like once they do that, their body is destroyed, quote unquote, during it. They're recalled back to heaven. They can only do it to really clean up. If they use it in an attack, they're done. Yeah, it's the extra planar rules of like, if you kill a fiend, if you kill an angel, it goes home. Yeah. Angels only die in heaven. If there are creatures who do that, like angels, they should have a supernova death thing. They're like, okay, I'm just going to explode and take myself out and take everything else out around me and cleanse this area of all this evil because it doesn't matter that I'm dying. Yes for angels, but no for fiends. Angels are, at the end of the day, holy constructs. They are there to do a job and get it done. So yeah, they they will smite themselves to take down something in the nearby vicinity if it gets the job done. For a fiend, for a for a devil or a demon, the idea of dying and having to go back and reset is anathema to everything they want. They will not allow it. That's why they have hellish rebuke. Because they can like, no, how fucking dare you? Yeah. Right? I, I will remain here. Whereas a devil will gladly sacrifice themselves for the greater good. Yeah. But again, unless they are directed to, not at all lethal. It is construct rules. It's the same as the skeleton. If it's told to kill, it'll do so without remorse and without question. But it also probably won't because no, life is generally, if you're good aligned, life is a good thing. We shouldn't kill. That said, I'm working on a game that has a lot of divine fingers directly involved in the character pie, and I am 100% sending a Terminator angel oh God, after yeah. one of the party. Yeah, that's going to be fun. Having players think they know what is going to happen and getting to do the like, no, 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 You've, you have misunderstood the situation. That's always fun. And I think angels are prime material for that. Yeah. It's like, oh, no, it's an angel. It's good. It's here for the good God. You're like, no, 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 It's here for the will of the good God. Yeah. That's not necessarily all sweet and lovey, bud. Mm -mm. No, no. If, if eliminating you works for the greater good, 
then that's how the divine plan works. Mm -hmm. I'm playing, uh, I'm working on a, on a patron game right now where all the players start out at first level. They're all drawn to, they're all drawn together because they're heavily connected to a God and those divine forces pull them together. And they all end up after session one at first level with an artifact. So they just become these ultimate glass cannons. There's no way that they wouldn't attract the attention of other people who that's like, nope, nope, we're just gonna solve this right now. If I am Asmodeus and I find out that a first level cleric has the Book of Exalted Deeds, do you think I'm not gonna immediately just like, no, no, Baylor, bring it to me. Right, and not just that, but they've got the Book of Exalted Deed. Their friend has the eye of, you know, of Venka and like everyone's got some crazy fucking thing. If I can wipe this party and just take that all home, I, I win. Yeah, I need all those things now. Or at the very least, I need to stop this and put brakes on this because wherever this is going can't possibly be good. That is the other thing that I always run. Like, I run Asmodeus is like in a Cold War. He is either looking for a thing where he can get it and pull the trigger and win, or he's looking to make sure the status quo persists. That many artifacts, it's like, no, no, no. Bring me one of them, kill the rest of them and scatter it. Do not bring all those things back here, because if I have all those things, do you think heaven is going to put up with that? Get me the eyeball, because I can make deals with Vecna, and get rid of the rest of it. Also, like, could he even trust anyone to send off to gather all six no, things? never. Like, the only thing you could possibly do is, and it's honestly part of why it might work for a first level party, is if you get a squad of imps. And it's just like, you are new enough to not know how much power I'm entrusting you with when I say, bring this back to me. Right. Just get it and bring it back. Like, ee, and they'll just yeah, run it sure. with like, you know, whatever over you their, say, boss. They'll just run with it over their heads right back into hell. Yeah. I got it, boss. Good work. It's like a big hand or something. It's gross. <laughs> it's exactly what would happen. All right. Anything else you want to add then as we round up season one? I think that about covers it. I'm pretty satisfied with that. Anything you got? Just that. I've really enjoyed making this show, that it's been a light uh, for me, and it's been an incredibly uh, engaging and informative experience, and that I owe a lot of that to you. So I would just like to say thank you for being an amazing co-producer. I did all my mushy shit in the mailbag episode. I'm done. Until season two. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> All right, and I guess that wraps up season one. We will see you all again soon for season two. And I think we've pretty much decided that season two, episode one is going to be the Coatl. Yeah, I think we're going Coatl in first. Yeah. Start off with Carlos. We'll see you for uh, season two, episode one, Coatl with Carlos. Later, folks. For more information about us, notes for each episode, and ways you can help support the show, head over to killeverymonster.com. If any of the ideas we've discussed on the show have sparked some of your own, tell us about it on Twitter at KEM Podcast. You'll find me at DJ Malenfont and Aram at Aram Vardian. For ad free episodes, early releases, bonus episodes, print ready maps, Dylan's DM notes, and my character sheets from each encounter, head over to patreon.com slash kill every monster. You can also listen to ad free episodes and bonus content by subscribing to the show on Apple Podcasts. Our theme intro and many of the sound effects you hear in the show were created by Battle Bards. Check them out at BattleBards.com. This episode was produced by Aram Vartian and Dylan Mollenfont. I also did the editing. And we'll see you next time for Kill, Kill Every, Every Monster. This show was produced and edited by Dead Ghost Productions. Find out more about us and all the shows we make at deadghostpro.com. <laughs>